Hi, my name is Ayman Aitani. I'm a business growth specialist. I'm going to talk to you today about the mistakes of early stage founders. These are common mistakes that I come across uh, from many of the founders that I advise. And I want to bring them up so that we can discuss them in full details. Um, I'm available on Instagram for any questions that you might have. And for next week, I'm talking about how to differentiate your business if you're not the first to market. So if your idea is not the first idea that you're doing, uh, there are others who have done this in the market, how you can differentiate yourself. We're doing that next week. Uh, all right, so one of the first things that uh, I see very common of early stage founders is um, listening to friends and family. So they rely on the friends and family uh, the feedback friends and family to believe that they have a good idea. Friends and family will not buy from you. They will not use your product. They might buy once, but they might not buy again. Um, you need to talk to strangers to get the opinions. Remember when you had a bad hair day or a bad haircut, when you gain weight? I've had so many times when I gain weight, people tell me, I, friends and family say, Ayman, you look so much healthier now, which is a very polite way of saying, Ayman, let's do some weight. So this is what friends and family do when it comes to somebody that they know. So don't rely, don't feel that, because I had so many discussions with founders. I tell them, look, they tell me, all my friends say that they'll do this and they'll buy. I was like, no, don't base it on that. And then a few months later, they'll say, okay, they didn't buy from me. And now I have to go out in the market and figure out who would buy and what they sell. So what I always recommend is talking to strangers. So, and it could be not very costly. So you run a small campaign, it's an ad message that takes you to WhatsApp or to something else or to Google Form or something like this. To get feedback from them on, it could be at the idea stage, it could be at an early product stage and so on, to get feedback from strangers on what they will or will not use. The second common mistake that I see is obsessing over the name and the logo. Some founders delay their launch for many, many months to get the perfect name and the perfect logo. If you think about the global brands around you, there are certain terms and, uh, and words that don't make sense, but when you build the brand over time, you're able to do this. Um, the product market fit means that people, you, you know what people need and they're paying for what you're providing them for. And that takes a while to figure out. That takes a long time to figure out. Um, so the more you delay the choice of your name and logo, the more, um, the more you're delaying the product market fit. So if you look at logos from brands that you recognize, you see how they change over time. So there are definitely ways for you to change, to go with something for now and then modify it and to see how it changes and, 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 and where we're going. Uh, to give you an idea about uh, the name, uh, so the name of the business advisor I started is called Think Media Labs. It came from the concept I did at the time was, it's a think tank. So that's the think a tank approach, that's think. It's media, we're heavily focused on, on, on media. And then labs, as in we do a lot of experimentation with different types of tools and so on. So I thought, you know, that's a, that's a great name. So that was something that, you know, it took me a while to do and I did. And then with time, you get to see that one, the name doesn't mean much. Two, no matter how fancy I make the name, what I think it is, uh, for me, a clear indicator was when you get deliver food delivery, uh, we, we got examples of, uh, I'm, I'm here to deliver to Pink Media Loves. So it's these random things, or when they call and ask, or when they want to introduce me, introduce a member of my team. Uh, so the name won't matter. With time, it won't matter. It will always be very different and, and what it is. So I would not worry a lot about, about the logo, uh, especially the logo. Yeah, there are always ways for you to rebrand and do it and change it. Now, getting the product right before launching, the discussions I have with the founders a lot of the time has to do with, hey man, I'm ready to launch this month, but I just need one more thing before we can go live. There's always one more thing. And then a month after, they know that they have another one more thing. So that one more thing that they need to build or do or optimize on delays months. When you go live, you're able to identify uh, uh, the product market fit. Uh, so what people like and don't like, and people will tell you what they don't like. They'll tell you by not buying, they tell you by ignoring you, or they tell you by voicing it loudly in the social media comments, or the inbox messages, or their complaints. So um, 
again, don't delay if you have lack of clarity on a few things. Um, there are a lot of uh, easy ways to do this. And this goes back to my first point about using WhatsApp and, uh, and Google Forms. I had a discussion once with a Saudi founder. She's early stage, but I had a discussion with her, which was thorough, much more thorough than I usually have with, uh, with early stage founders. And I asked her, well, how come you have the answers to some parts of your business so early on in your business? She said, Ayman, we ran the business on WhatsApp and Google Sheets and Google Forms for the longest time. And then once we figured out what the market needs, uh, they built the technology. So she was a marketplace. She matches a supplier and you know, supply and demand. So uh, she matches the two together. And she was doing all of, the, uh, all of the matching manually. So people apply, they fill in a form that they were interested in this, and then she'd WhatsApp the suppliers to see what they have, and she'd call people that she knows. And so a lot of this was done manually for a long time. And then once they figured out what all of the sites needed, that's when they built the technology. So that's why they're able to build uh, something better. Uh, investment. So a lot, of, a lot of the early stage founders, they feel that investment is a rite of passage. It's something that they have to do if they are to be taken serious as an entrepreneur. And it's not, you don't need investment. You don't need to raise money if you, to validate yourself. The validation comes from people buying from you and coming back, come buying from you again. And even if you insist on having discussions with investors because you feel you need to, or if you, because your business is very capital intensive, you need traction. Don't waste your time or the investor's time to go to the investor with no traction. They need to see traction meaning uh, in the form of sales revenue, downloads, signups, bookings, return bookings, some form of activity around your product. I'm not saying profitability, it's just you're showing that there's a lot more uh, coming up in terms of information and activity and so on that, 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 that you will show that there's growth there. Um, another common mistake is the unit economics. Unit economics, ignoring unit economics, meaning that how much does it cost you to make? How much, how much do you pay to get in a customer and how much do you sell the, the, the service and product for? That uh, formula takes a while to figure out and to understand. And that is very important for achieving profitability, for raising money, for looking at how, about how you execute your business. So those are very, very important. Uh, and um, another aspect as well, uh, uh, what I see is they look for, founders look for, especially on the early stage, when they're looking to hire, they focus less on skill and more for passion for the idea. So they sometimes falsely believe that the staff that they're hiring needs to be very passionate about, about their idea and as passionate as the founder. So one, they won't be as passionate as the founder. It's not their business. Uh, it's yours. This is one. Two, um, you, they don't know you, you don't know them. It's too much to expect them to be passionate about you or your idea and they're still on the shore. They're still not in deep into your business. It's going to take them a while to figure out who you are, what you stand for, what you're trying to solve. Yes, they have the broad gist of it, but they can stand passionately behind it. And three, you need skills, not more than passion. So they need to have the right skill set to take care of it. Um, another aspect as well is uh, the ease of making money uh, in a business. So a lot of the misconceptions that I can come across saying, I'll run this for two or three years and then we'll sell. Or I'll run this for, for a year or two and then I'll hire in a top shop to see oh, who's going to run this for me. Or uh, like the videos you see on YouTube where uh, they promise you being on a nice island. You run a few ads, you send them to your website and people buy. They, they, they run to pay you your money. They don't bother you with customer support. You have no execution issues. And that's not, that's not the reality at all. So that's definitely a common mistake that I see. And, and if you look at all of the businesses you're looking at Kareem uh, and the region, like Kareem's acquisition, Souk, and others, you're looking at seven, eight, 10, 11, 12 years. So those are usually the ranges of the years where it takes to really make an impact. And another common misconception I see wrong assumptions, wrong assumptions. So um, I speak with founders every day and I remember always that I always have a week where I speak with two or three different founders in two or three different countries. They have no idea about each other. 
I asked him, do you know this guy? Do you know this company? And so on. And each has been in business for a year or two. And they don't know each other. And what really makes them uncomfortable is they have the, the arrogance and the over unnecessary confidence that says, we're the only one, not even regionally in the Middle East, but globally, who are solving it in this way or solving it this way. And we're going to be so big. And so on. It's like, look, you know, there are two or three others that we met just met this week. And that's from my understanding of those. I'm sure there are even more in the market. So uh, that, make, just make sure that you know what the market is about, who others are there, what they're doing, and so on. You can do that by, by looking at soccer conferences, you're looking at sort of events, you can look at uh, the, the accelerators and so on that, that, that are hosting things. So if I am to summarize, uh, Building a business continues to be not easy. It's not like you see on the internet or what uh, you make misassumptions on in events or what people tell you on their own stage or digitally sharing throughout their events. It's not easy. And there are many misconceptions about the ease of growth and it's not. So this is why uh, I'm trying to raise awareness about the pitfalls of it and how to solve it. Uh, so that's it for the topic uh, for today. Uh, the second part that we're doing here, we'd like to feature uh, uh, Raisa. Raisa had questions. Uh, I missed Raisa's email. Uh, she asked me a few questions and then uh, I went over it and I said, Raisa, why don't you join next webinar and we can talk. So I thought that could be then. That, that's why I thought we'd feature Raisa and uh, has been also participating a lot with the, with the events. So thank you Raisa for joining again. And uh, apologies for, 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 for missing your email. Uh, and, uh, how are you today? I'm good, and you? <laughs> I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> One of your questions is, it was about the services business, uh, the business, the service business, and how difficult it is to scale and so on, and, and how, to, how to build and do things like this. Is, was that still the direction that, that, that you wanted the discussion to go? Um... Yes, actually, I, I realize that many companies are reluctant to sign up for uh, hourly late and they want okay. to go for fixed uh, retainer fees. Okay. But, uh, you, but later on, after I signed, I signed the agreement, I realized this is more, th uh, this is more than what I, how I can say, the, the work volume or work it's volume much is than, it's much bigger than than, than you than yes you yes yes okay and um, the type of consulting services that you do is you're helping businesses out of Japan to expand globally mm -hmm. is that it can you can you sh share some some uh, can you share with everybody else a little bit more the name of the company and what is it you do and how you do it okay so uh, my company is a marketing and project management uh, consultancy for Japanese enterprises in Japan to come to UAE. Right. So uh, one of the company that I'm working with is um, developing a hover bike. <laughs> and we are supposed to exhibit in the Dubai boat show in March but the event is now postponed till the, till the end of November. Due to COVID? Yes, due to COVID. While I was working with them, um, every end of the month, I send, a, uh, I send a detail of the work that I have done, also as well as the invoice. But then they started to wonder, what is this time? <laughs> Why this takes so much time? Why, this, why is this an hour and a half? It should be an hour. Be like this, like this. Yes, yes, yes. So they started to negotiate or like ask me the discount. And then, um, you know, for me, I feel like I was denied somehow. Like I was disqualified for this place or like I, I wasn't feeling well actually. Um, uh, right, so what you're going through is very common in a services business mm -hmm. where um, when they come to you in the beginning, um, they're worried and they're afraid and so on, but when after you deliver it and, and they see the end result and so on, they feel more confident that this has been resolved and they want to argue about price and so on, so it's very common. Um, there are different models to do it, and I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through the different models and some suggestions for, uh, for, for how you can handle each. 
So one of the models would be it's a fixed rate, it's a monthly monthly rate. You say it's X thousand dirhams per month, and you'd say this is my X thousand dirhams per month uh, uh, for for whatever for the work uh, uh, that you're doing. The problem with this is, as you mentioned, where you have sometimes cases where there's more work to be done. It could be either because the business of your customer is changing dynamically. Mm -hmm. Or because you were, you were not informed in detail what they wanted, and when you went in, you found really what 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 there is about. Uh, what I've done in, before in such cases, and again, it depends on the relationship with the customer. Is I used to say that look, when I do this work, it's it's X thousand dirhams a month for X number of man days or man hours or whatever whatever it is, and I log everything. So they're still paying a fixed rate, and then I log everything, and then over time, so if it's a long term relationship, over time I look at it's a month, two months, three months, and so on. If if it's averaging out on average within the mandate, mandate so let's say we you say you gave them four mandates, all right? If on average it's around four mandates per month, and some months it's a little more, sometimes a little less, and the average is fine, then uh, then there's nothing to bring up. However, if you're consistently exceeding those hours, so what I've done in that case is I've showed them my timesheet support to say, look, I have this relationship with you, and I'm comfortable, I'm happy doing the work that we're doing. Because uh, because I had this read scenario, a client that I really really like, I really like working with them and so on. But we're consistently exceeding exceeding. So I had an open discussion with them, saying, "Look, um, our agreement is X number of days, and and but I'm happy doing the work. I'm not bringing this up to try to wait to make money, but I'm trying to show you that over the last three months, look 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 what happened and so on." So what they did was um, uh, as well as what I liked is what they did was they looked at it saying, "Okay, let's examine what you what you were doing." They say, "No, this one we could remove of you. We'll give it to this guy. This one and so on." So they were able to reduce the workload, so that I can stay within the the, the four uh, the four mandates uh, that I had. This mm -hmm. way, uh, yes, of course, there was an opportunity for me to make more money, and this was not there. But either way, I'm fine because I maintained the relationship with them. Uh, I I am now within my uh, the average of of four mandates, and three, uh, they know that there's there's no surprise billings. There's no they know that this is this is this is it this is it coming through, and so on. So that I felt has addressed the issue of uh, them coming in and trying to examine why is this happening, why is this, why is this, so on, so. So this is this is this is one one way of doing this, where you have a monthly uh, a monthly fee, x number of mandates, you log everything, and then if you look at the average, if it's within that average, a bit more, it's okay. If if you're consistently hitting it, then you need to have an open discussion, and depending on the relationship and how that goes, I was fortunate the relationship was was, was good. And, and, and it's a long-term relationship, so that's why I was able to have this open discussion. So that's one model. The second model would be, and I found that uh, with other clients as well, where I've had cases where I uh, we uh, I used to send them, so my team used to send, that was more of my team, they used to send them invoices, and then they said, no, how come is this much, and we thought it was less, and so on, and then we go into, and those are people who have good relationships with, and then we go into the integrity, as you said, the half an hour, half an hour, and why, and why didn't you tell us about this, and we, we could have done this differently, and so on. And for me, always a priority in a services business is like, like, like the one you're in is the relationship itself. So I didn't like that every, we're always questioning the money and there's trust and so on. So the way we, we, we've tried to solve this is we started to look at uh, weekly scheduling. So we, we, we agreed on hourly rates and we started to look at weekly scheduling, saying that in the coming week, I'm going to do A, B, C, and D. Uh, uh, the hourly estimate is about this much. And I'm going, to, I'm going to deliver A, B, and C. This way, they, they approve, before we do the work, they approve the work for the week. They say, look, this week, uh, but it's important to show them that what they're paying for this week, they're going to get something. So, so for them, it's not enough to work for the week and then not see an actual result, a deliverable, a report, an update, or whatever it is. So, uh, it, so it can't be a lot of level of fractions, small fraction stuff. It has to be. So the advantage of this is, if it's a dynamically moving business, you have the week, so you have you adjust with them. You're doing this one week in advance. It could be one week or two weeks, depending on what iteration you want to do. So no matter how the business changes, you're planning for 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 two weeks or one week. Two, they're they're pre-approving the time you're going to spend. So they they know that you're going to spend this amount of time on this topic. This is what their output is going to. So they're pre-approving this. You're you know you won't have the discussions with them saying. Why this is this much and that much and so on, uh, and three you have clarity and so they will tell you you know what we thought this was smaller, uh, we don't want this, or why is this so big? Uh, they will have a discussion with you on making it smaller so more clarity on on, on what they had expected and so on. 
The disadvantage of, of this RISA is um, your estimates might be off for the week. Uh, and if your estimates are a little bit off, you have to absorb that. So that's, that's more of a learning curve uh, down the line and so on. So that could be a, a potential second model. The third model would be if it's a long-term client and, and you wanted to work with them, and you, before you want to do the hourly rate with them, I would do a small project, month, two, three months, whatever it is, where you try out each other. It's a fixed term project. This way your damage is three months. So if it's an absurdly amount of work, you're limited your damage to two, three months, six months, four months, three months, whatever, at a fixed rate. And you've tried them out and so on. And then you have a relationship saying, okay, for the new projects that you've asked me for, I prefer to do it hourly, mandate rate. My, my method, I'm proposing that we do weekly estimates and so on, or we'll do a monthly estimate with X number of mandates. So those are three different ways that I've been able to do this in the past. And all of these came through problems and trial and error, and they don't work with all customers. That's why you have different, uh, you have different uh, um, models and so on. And the important part is always in the services business, uh, business is, is the patient, maintaining the relationship even at a loss. So which of these three models would you think would make a little bit more sense for you and you think it might work uh, for at least some of the customers? I think <laughs> if I consider the Japanese uh, character of Japanese people, I think Priyapluvo sounds very good. Okay. 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 And you think you can plan it down? You can plan it one 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 week or two weeks in advance and have clear clear deliverables. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, what I like about this model is it's pre-approved, as in you know there's there are no surprises. The risk is on you to do the right estimates. Uh, what I don't don't like about, about this model is obviously the risk on you. And two is we're always scoping work. We're always scoping. So we're always every two weeks or every week we're always estimating and doing things and so on. With the, with the first model I told, you, I told you about, and depends on the customer, what I like when I work with them is whatever they throw at me, I just, I just jump into and I do. So it depends on, on, on the nature of the business and what they want to do. So what I like about that, the first model where it's a fixed retainer with X number of mandates that you keep track of. And so we don't have to question cost every mm -hmm. time and so on, but it depends on the customer. Some customers, they say, no, I will need to see everything before them and I need to approve everything and so on. The others, they say, look, I don't want to talk money every time. Just, you know, give me a lump sum things and, 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 and let's do a bunch of things within those mandates. So it depends on, on, the, on the customer and, and, and the culture that, that you brought up. But I like the pre-approval part. It's nice and clean. There are emails there. Um, if there are any misunderstandings, you can clarify it. Or if there's anything drastically wrong, whether it's from your side or their side, the window of damage is an iteration of one week or two weeks or so on. Thank you so much. Just keep in mind, Raisa, you can't go back and change it with existing customers. They freak. They freak out. So apply <laughs> this for new customers. Okay. So, so yeah, yeah. Unless you have a toxic relationship or you're losing money a lot on, 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 on one of the old one or one of the existing customers that you have. But I found that these improvements I've done gradually with new customers. They say, okay, man. And then from the beginning at the proposal stage saying, look, this is how I price. I do two weeks, I do pre approvals and so on, or I do the, the, the so, so you say, this is how we do it. We do this and you need to approve from your side. And so, so from the beginning, it's like this. And you see from their feedback, you see, okay, I want to change this, I want to change that and so on. If it makes sense for you, you, you try it with the next customer and so on. And that's how we add one, one layer at a time. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you guys for your question. Thank you for participating and I yeah, wish you patience when it comes to uh, working with anything that's client facing requires patience and understanding of somebody of the people in front of you and trying to solve things for their benefit and so on. So it takes a lot of insight and push and, and patience and and putting yourself in their shoes and so on. So yes, so good luck with that. Thank you. All right, so that concludes the sessions we had today, which is the content part and the question part. Thank you for, uh, thank you for joining, and I'll always be available by you uh, over Instagram or, uh, or by email. Thank you.